coming. I, uh, my name is John Eckenrode. I'm the director of the Family Life Development Center. And on behalf of the Family Life Development Center and the College of Human Ecology, I'd like to uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Barber. But before I tell you a little bit about Brian, I first wanted to thank a couple people. Uh, Janice Whitlock, who's in the back, who many of you know, who are students are here. Janice is a research scientist in the Family Life Development Center and helped arrange this talk. And I also wanted to thank uh, Patty Fair, who has been, who has ably provided support for this event. Well, Brian uh, uh, Barber received his PhD in family studies from the University of Utah and is now a professor in the Department of Child and Family Studies at the University of Tennessee and founding director of the Center for the Study of Youth and Political Violence. His research centers on adolescent development and social context in a variety of nations and ethnic groups across the globe. His recent work focuses on adolescent development in context of political violence with particular attention paid to youth from the Gaza Strip in Bosnia. His work in this area is the subject of numerous articles, book chapters, and two forthcoming books, Adolescence in War, How Youth Deal with Political Violence, and One Heart, So Many Stones, The Saga of Palestinian Youth. Dr. Barber serves on the Executive Council of the Society for Research on Adolescence and is on the editorial board of several journals, including the Journal of Adolescent Research. He's also been a technical advisor uh, to the World Health Organization and to UNICEF. His work has been supported by the National Institute for Mental Health, the Social Science Research Council, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Jerusalem Fund, and the United States Institute for Peace. Now, when we think of children and youth exposed to political conflict and war, we naturally think of stress, despair, and disrupted lives. There is certainly ample evidence for such negative developmental consequences. Dr. Barber's work is special in this regard because he has had great skill and eloquence in providing us with a more nuanced view of the important variations in the experiences of youth who are growing up in societies affected by conflict. Only by employing solid social science research methods to understanding youth in war zones can we hope to design interventions and policies that will assist youth who must somehow manage to grow up and hopefully thrive despite their exposure to loss, violence, and hatred. So we are thankful for Brian for taking on these important but difficult studies and especially thankful that he could be with us today to share some of the results of his research. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brian Barber. Thank you very much, John. Um, I appreciate very much being here at Cornell. I, uh, Cornell has been kind of a mythical image in my mind for over 20 years now. I've never, never been here before, but I know many of your faculty. I know many of my colleagues who were students here, and so it's a real <coughs> delight to be here. To the extent that my presence is beneficial to you, uh, you owe it all to Janice Whitlock, who for many years has been a strong supporter of mine. Um, when you write about a, an area like this, so narrow, so poorly understood, it's always very um, positive and helpful to have a reader who reads your stuff and gives you positive and constructive comments. And Janice has done that for me regularly. So I appreciate that very much. I'm going to try to do several things today. Um, and uh, as I talk to you about a topic which uh, I'm sure is of interest to all of us, but very poorly understood by any of us. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit more insight today about how uh, life is for many hundreds of thousands of youth around the world who live in circumstances that are such that you and I uh, have difficulty even uh, contemplating them, let, al let alone living in them. First, I'm going to give you a brief description of how I got to this area of research so you have an idea of how uh, <clears throat> research careers develop. I certainly did not expect to be talking to a group like you about this subject uh, even as recently as 10 or 12 years ago. I'm going to talk to you about some of what I've learned about how little uh, we actually do know, uh, we as professionals, and therefore how much, we, how much more we need to know. 
I'm going to give you some data, as it were, some findings that uh, I've made in the research I've done that will help you, I hope, see just how, just how complicated this area is. You know, we from a distance have a tendency with a kind of a soundbite mentality to think we understand what's happening in the world and uh, when in fact uh, circumstances are far more complex than they really are and oftentimes that means that things are better than we sometimes think they are or that people are more capable than we sometimes give them credit for. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about the last phase and that's how uh, research findings of this kind can lead towards efforts to try to make a difference in one small way. Uh, in 1994, so just 13 years ago, I was happily about a kind of normal career studying youth, uh, normal youth uh, in a variety of cultures around the world. Um, and I was invited uh, by a team of sociologists to join them. Uh, they had an interest for a variety of reasons in studying Palestinian families and had invi invited me because I had by then some expertise on adolescence and, 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 and that was an important issue. I was very disinterested in that invitation, in fact, turned it down several times. I was very busy. Uh, I'm a seasoned traveler. I know languages and I, I, I like cultures a lot, but I just had no interest in that part of the world and uh, didn't want to go. But I'm also a sucker for a free trip, and eventually they persuaded me, and I agreed to give them two weeks of time, uh, consult with them, and then I would leave the project and go on to um, my more favored uh, areas of study. Um, how many of you have been, by the way, to, the, uh, to Israel or the Palestinian territories? Could you show me by hand? So just literally a couple of you, okay? Then, then you don't know from personal experience just how captivating that part of the world is. Captivating not just in beauty, uh, but captivating in um, the critical confluence of forces that, that occur in that part of the world. Geography, history, religion, culture, politics, and war. I was captivated by it. Uh, and... Um, I, oddly enough, turned out to be the only member of that research team that survived that first project. And it, uh, changed, it changed my life as a professional and in some ways in, a pers in my personal life as well. We as a group conducted the largest ever study of, of Palestinian families, probably of, any, of Arab families of, uh, ever. 7,000 families with adolescent children, with mothers and fa fathers responding to our surveys uh, above 90 percent. Uh, so we have a huge data set uh, and it's valuable in a variety of ways. I was trained as a what we call a quantitative researcher. I was trained how to write questionnaires and and that's far more complex than you might think it is. And to to collect information from large groups of individuals by having them fill out surveys and so forth. Um, and that's what we did. Despite that massive amount of data that we collected, and we've published a number of things out of it, which I think are good, good pieces, um, I progressively felt very uncomfortable speaking for a population that I, knew, that I understood so poorly. I grew up in middle, upper middle class, white Los Angeles, California. Uh, the Middle East was a very different experience for me. And despite data on 7,000 families, um, uh, I, I knew quickly that I didn't know very much. And there's a part of me that's very um, uh, stubborn, I guess. When I get something in my head, I pursue it. And it became clear to me that uh, I needed to ground myself in this culture. I certainly didn't understand the conflict that I was studying uh, or the people and particularly the youth that were engaged in it. Now, let me re refresh your memory a little bit. This is 1994. This is one year after the Oslo Peace Accords were signed, which was the formal end, ostensibly, to conflict between Palestinian, native, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. That was the first intifada, 1987 to 1993, and that's the period of conflict that I have studied intensively. You will know that in 2000, that conflict re-erupted into the second intifada. And my experiences there coincided, um, coincidentally, 
uh, with uh, that period of time between the two periods of conflict. So I decided to dive in. Uh, this is the first time I'd ever done anything like this before. We collected our surveys through contacts through the United Nations, who still to this day uh, run schools for Palestinian refugees throughout the territories up through ninth grade. And in the process of co collecting all of those data, I became friendly with many of the education leaders, including the head of the education system in Gaza. I called him up and said, this is what I've decided to do. I, I want to live in a refugee camp. I want to experience as much of the culture as I possibly can. I want to learn the language. So could you please place me with a family um, with uh, just those criteria? I want someone has to speak English well enough to start teaching me Arabic. And the family needs to be willing to allow me to experience life as much as uh, a foreigner can in that part of the world. He had no difficulty finding such a family, and I began a series of, of residencies in the Gaza Strip um, in refugee camps or near refugee camps for different periods of time. The first time was for six months and then for four, but if you add all those periods together, it comes to about a year and a half where I lived and, again, by intent, uh, tried to learn as much as possible about youth in that part of the world, in that little tiny strip of the world. I had the sense that, that the families that I lived with did open their lives to me in most fundamental ways. Um, and uh, I learned the language that is uh, not written, or um, I can't read or, or write Arabic, but I, I could at that time speak fairly, um, fairly well socially. But of course, my, my interviews were always done with translation. Um, and I also, of course, did many, uh, many hours, hundreds of hours of observation and conversation with youth. I then designed a new survey, which I'm very proud of because it was informed, much unlike the first one, it was informed by real on-the-ground experience. And if we had more time, I could talk to you about how research methodologies can evolve over time and how the questions that you ask um, dictate the methods that you, you use and the sequencing of those methods. But I did another survey, and, and um, part of the information that I'll present to you today is based on that survey of 900,000 youth who had been uh, adolescents during that first intifada. Just a few pictures of what it's like since a few of you have been there. This is approaching a refugee camp. We're in a town now, um, but you'll see the beginnings of a refugee camp. Refugee camps were added typically to small villages. Um, uh, in 1948 and 1967 when the Palestinian refugee situation arose and then grew and grew and grew from there uh, in un unsystematic ways. That would be the interior of the first camp that I lived in. Very narrow um, alleyways, sand floors. Gaza uh, is on the coast, the Mediterranean, so it's uh, actually a, a, a beach terrain. Uh, and here on either side of this um, alleyway would be homes fairly simplistic homes, uh, stone floors, indoor plumbing, but uh, channeled to open sewers in the alleyways. You'll see in a moment there you see a, an open sewer draining uh, an alleyway in the camp, and those would then drain into larger uh, kind of rivers of sewage, and then it would either dump directly into the Mediterranean, depending on if the camp was close to the water, or it would be dumped into fields and percolate down into the groundwater. There are eight camps in Gaza, still are, the smallest of which uh, now has about 15,000 people, the largest about 110,000 people. The one of the camps that I lived in, mostly this one here, uh, in the middle of the strip, had about 15,000 then. Here you're looking down on a home, a typical home that is in, as you can see, uncompleted stages of, of development and um, people add on doors and windows and plaster when finances permit. These are some of the youth that I studied and, and lived with for long periods. These would have been the stone throwers of that first intifada. The Palestinian youth made their name, as it were, uh, um, by throwing stones at uh, tanks and jeeps and got a lot of news coverage for that. This is the first family I lived with um, in one of the larger camps. I still have contact with these individuals. This would be breakfast uh, 
we had two meals a day. Um, what you see on the, the, the big bowl there is called fool, F-O-U-L-E. It's an Egyptian dish, much like what we'd call refried beans. A little spicier, though. Um, and we would eat that with home-baked uh, pita bread, baked in community ovens, and it's the most delicious thing you can imagine. Uh, we don't know what pita bread is in the United States after you've uh, tasted that. That would be breakfast, and then we'd meet um, typically mid-afternoon when all the children were home from school and have a meal together, and that always had white rice and always roasted vegetables of some kind, sometimes fish, although it's very expensive, sometimes chicken, and very rarely beef or lamb. That was a little kitchen that the mother of the family cooked our meals in, and that's Heba, the happiest human being I've ever met. Um, she, remains, she retains that radiance, uh, even now that she's a young teenage girl, but I, I will always remember Heba as exuding a, a brilliance and a happiness that just was stunning, and especially when you paired that with the circumstances that she was in which is one of the grandest lessons I could teach you right now. Uh, uh, and that is that uh, human, uh, humans have the ability to find joy and, uh, and sometimes happiness in the very difficult circumstances that we sometimes face ourselves in. Okay, now what did I learn from the scientific side? <clears throat> I was surprised uh, in my studies of the Palestinian youth. I had come prepared with theories that I had been taught about stress, um, that any population of young people who had just experienced six years of near daily conflict, participating in conflict by throwing stones, by, by doing a variety of other ways of confronting soldiers, this was long before the days of suicide bombing, um, and also being treated quite harshly. Uh, I won't present to you data, data today, but uh, um, uh, occupying forces, as you probably can tell from day-to-day um, -day news, are, are, are brutal in their treatment of people, and um, especially youth in this case, because they were on the forefront of the battle. So they experienced a lot of violence, both as perpetrators and as victims, day-to-day, -day, loss of life, and so forth. And I was prepared to find a population of young people who were destroyed psychologically and socially. And I found the opposite, a group of very quiet, humble, gentle, respectful kids who were eager to continue their education, were having decent social relationships, respect for authority, and so forth. And it was, it was stunning to me. I was not prepared for it. It violated all the expect expectations I had, as I mentioned to you. So I didn't trust that. I mean, I, the, the experience was real. I, there's no question that I was certain of what I was observing, but I thought, well, maybe this is something peculiar. Maybe it's peculiar about Palestinians. Maybe it's peculiar about this conflict. I, I can't yet let myself make conclusions before uh, testing it elsewhere, I thought. And so uh, I chose to replicate this whole experience uh, in Bosnia for a variety of reasons. Um, and I did everything except live for long periods with families, but I did the extensive interviews with youth and then the survey afterwards and so forth. So I have now some uh, what we'd call good, relatively good comparative data. And the reason Bosnia was selected was uh, because it, A, was primarily a Muslim population, B, historically the region had been in political uh, upheaval over the decades and centuries prior, and see the youth um, had been exposed to years of often daily, often severe uh, violence. So I thought it would be a good comparison study. Here are some of the Bosnian uh, young people that I met with and interviewed at length. I'm gonna, I'm gonna present you findings a little bit later in the presentation, but I want to back up now and and give you some insight into, as I mentioned earlier, just how little we as professionals, let alone lay people, are prepared to understand uh, these phenomena that we're now studying. So I learned that my, the research I had, I had been trained in uh, had not equipped me whatsoever to understand youth in these circumstances. I also learned that youth experience in war was but youth experience war in very different ways 
again, in that kind of monolithic soundbite mentality we have, we think of war and we have this image that it's one thing and it's always has a, a continuous or a stable impact on groups. I'll show you later that war is experienced in very different ways. And obviously, therefore, if you're trying to make a difference in the lives of youth, you need to understand how that war was experienced. Up until recently, youth perspectives themselves were not consulted relative to their own experience. And that's, again, typical Western strategy, experts knowing better and not going to the source. And um, much of what I've learned about this complexity has come from youth themselves. Not surprisingly then, uh, since war is experienced differently and individual conflicts are different, we'll see later, youth adapt to political violence in very different ways. There isn't a recipe. In fact, there isn't, a, I, I couldn't predict after all of this experience, I couldn't tell you if a certain population of youth in a certain region of the world would suffer immeasurably broadly or not because I would need to know much more about the conflict itself and, as I'll show you uh, soon, much more of what's happening inside the head of the youth who are, who are enduring and conceiving of what this conflict is in their lives. All of these findings, I think, have very important policy implications, that is, implications for making a difference. But I'm afraid we're at the very early stages of of understanding just how we can adapt policies to deal with the intricacies that we're discovering. As to the limitations of the research literatures, there are basically three. I just completed a, a book chapter that reviewed uh, 95 studies that qualified to be included in the study, 95 studies where professionals had tried to empirically, that is with numbers, correlate youth experiences with uh, political violence and their functioning. Most, all of them, and most of them exclusively when they measure war, when we measure war, it's been to chronicle the amount of violence exposed to. So how many, how many deaths did you witness? How many times did someone do some act of violence against property in your presence? How many bombs did you hear, so forth? To chronicle trauma events, as they're called, and use that as a representation of what a child or a youth experience in war is. Secondly, on the other side of the equation, pardon me, when it has come to understanding or trying to study and understand how war affects young people, the bulk of the research has focused very narrowly on psychopathology or you know, problems inside ourselves, our minds, um, that one would expect to be correlated with or consequences of having been exposed to trauma or violence. And so post-traumatic post stress syndrome, for example, emerged uh, after the Vietnam War as one indicator of what might happen to people. Um, but notice that that's a very narrow focus on the individual and, and, and on, the, on the psychology of the individual. And I hope before the end of the day you'll understand better why that's so narrow and why that's so inadequate, a representation of what a youth experience might be. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been an inattention to youth perspectives themselves. Okay, what's, what's the problem with exp um, focusing primarily on exposure to violence, just chronicling the number of trauma events? Well, it ignores the complexity of war. Much more happens in war than just exposure to violence. There's deprivations of all kinds, there's fear, there's all sorts of experiences that one should be chronicling if one is trying to capture the experience of a young person in war. Most conflicts are fueled by social inequities or conflicts that are fought out in the midst of the conflict. And it's often those factors which are the factors which determine 
um, A, why the conflict starts, how it's lived through, and uh, sadly, often after conflict, after violence, those inequities remain and still govern as the predominating force or forces as to how a youth is or is not faring well. We could talk for a long time about just how diverse violence is itself. How close were you to it? How long did it last? How destructive was it? Is it new to you? Was it a surprise? Was it something, or was it something that's familiar to your experience? All of these are intricacies that need to go into the chronicling of even if we're just still narrowly focusing on violence, these are some of the ways in which um, it manifests itself in different ways. And uh, the focus on violence itself as an indicator of experience virtually ignores how a youth processes that event, that violence itself. And what we've learned through this research is just how capable youth are of dealing, conceiving, thinking about, trying to find answers for making sense out of their experiences, even in war. The narrow focus on individual psychopathology um, is, is limited because in much of the world, um, the individual isn't the core entity of importance. In much of the world, it's the community that matters. Let, let me digress just a moment to tell you an anecdote. It's not a digression, um, actually. Um, uh, an anecdote where I learned this for the first time. I was interviewing four Palestinian young boys about, I guess, their mid-teens in East Jerusalem. It's the first time I ever sat with a Palestinian. And um, I was at the very beginning of this research, and I had been trained in adolescent development, and I'm from the West, and I understand what kids think about and so forth. And I wanted to get to know these four young men, and I asked them one, you know, what we'd call open-ended question. I said, um, when are you most happy? Well, imagine what I was expecting to hear. When school's going well, or when things are going well with my girlfriend, or you know, I'm achieving well, or so forth. And these four young individuals gave me answers that were just way off target. And I privately thought to myself, well, they just don't understand. And so I probed and probed. I said, no, when are you, you, really happy? And they were perplexed. And, and uh, you know, I probed again. And finally, one of them said, you know, uh, one of them said to me, oh, I know, what you, I know what you mean. I finally know what you mean. And he said, I'm happy when I run. And I smiled and said, yep, you got it. Now you finally understood what I've wanted to know. Then he put a comma in his phrasing and said, but every time I run, the soldiers try to arrest me. I learned two important things from that moment. One is that, that they understood from the beginning what my question was. They were answering the question, when are you happy? I forgot to tell you what their answers were. They would say, I'm happy when the peace process is going well. Or I'm happy when Chairman Arafat is health as well, or, or so forth. And, and I, I, it was to those answers that I responded, no, 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 you know, you're not understanding what I'm saying. I want to know when you are happy. The lesson I learned finally from that, and I was embarrassed, frankly, was that they were answering the question to start with. That's when they were happy is when the peace process was going well. The second thing I learned was that even when they could dive to the level I was forcing them to go, that individual level, I'm happy when I run, in that context at least, that individual moment was always interrupted by the political context. The soldiers wanted to arrest me. So this narrow focus on the individual, how are you feeling? How, how is your self-esteem? What is your level of stress? is something that is relevant to us here in many parts of the West. Uh, but it's not relevant, or it's certainly not relevant as the primary indicator of a youth functioning in many, and I would say most parts of the world. Therefore, it's, it's not an accurate, or it's certainly not an adequate assessment of how well a youth is doing. It really is no surprise to us that someone exposed to violence would have higher stress levels. Uh, and that is the case, that often youth do have higher PTSD levels. The bigger question is, what is, what is the role of that stress in their broader social experiences? 
And what we found, uh, not just my research, but many others' research, is that when you look more broadly, even when you're looking at youth who've experienced extreme trauma like this uh, associated with violence, you look beyond stress to social relationships, to achievement in society, to civic engagement, and so forth, you find that most youth are functioning very well. And it's a subset of the youth, even in these extreme circumstances, that are suffering dramatically. That prevents us, therefore, from, from really understanding who to help. If our assessment of their functioning post-conflict or during conflict is so narrow that we conclude that everyone um, has high stress levels and therefore expend our limited resources in trying to help everyone as a panacea, we're missing. We're missing the ability to help those who for a variety of reasons that we need to understand much better are suffering dramatically. The inattention to youth perspectives um, is that adults have presumed to know what really matters to a youth when he or she is experiencing conflict. Now we're pretty intelligent individuals, most of us um, who, who are professionals at this, but that doesn't give us the ability to understand what really matters on the ground to that youth. Uh, and so many of the things that we have measured, frankly, have been not good assessments of what uh, really matters to youth themselves. It's prevented us from witnessing uh, the true capaci capacity that youth actually have to deal with circumstances that are challenging. And as we'll talk about in more depth later, it hides the ability to understand the degree to which youth make meaning and sense about their, their experience. And that turns out to be a critical element in understanding who does well and who doesn't do well. Let me give you, illustrate that now with some, some data, uh, summary data. I'm, I'm sorry I can't take the time now to give you all of the hard numbers here, but certainly happy to share those with you at another time. Let me start with two portraits that I've kind of amalgamated here from the variety of kinds of data we have. This would be the, the survey data of which we have uh, on, on hundreds and thousands of youth plus the interview data um, together. For the Bosnian youth, let me, let me remind you historically, 1992 uh, through 1996, there were four years of uh, solid war in the Balkan regions. The city of Sarajevo, where I did my research, was virtually encircled on the hilltops by Serbian or Serbian-friendly forces who put the city of, Serbi uh, of Sarajevo at siege for four continuous years, literally. So um, you could not leave your home uh, without wondering, if not experiencing, some <coughs> act of aggression from the forces above you. And this critical to understanding how youth can experience wars in different ways is the fact that this war was totally inexplicable to the youth. If there was, a, there were several common themes in the interviews I did with them, but one of them was how, how surprised they were that the war started. They had no idea it was coming. Literally from one day to the next, they were at war. The type of war that was exercised, the strategies um, involved, involved this distal presence of the enemy, mostly unseen, very unpredictable attacks. So you had no idea when an aggression would come and you couldn't see the enemy. There was very high violence uh, and destruction. In fact, in the Bosnian uh, situation, there was higher destruction, higher destruction of property, higher loss of life than there were in the Palestinian territories. So a very violent, a very destructive war from an unseen enemy in unpredictable ways. And there was virtually no ability for youth to involve themselves in this, to defend themselves or to engage on, on one side or the other. They were, as it were, sitting ducks, uh, or as I sometimes say, the pure victims of violence or trauma with no ability to withstand it, let alone no ability to understand it. Well, not surprisingly, here in 
in Bosnia, I found many of the results that I've ex had expected to see elsewhere. Um, and, you know, I was studying them, I guess it was already five years after their conflict in both cases, so we have some kind of long-term perspective here. The more the youth experienced the war, the violence of the war, the lower was their political participation later in life, as you might guess. Lower levels of civic involvement, less volunteering to help out society in a variety of ways. Higher rates of antisocial behavior in, in Bosnian society at that time, that, that means a lot of uh, hard drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of vandalism, a lot of uh, antisocial behavior in the ways that you and I conceive of them um, pretty commonly here higher rates of depression, and lower rates of social competence. That's the portrait that I would have expected everywhere. Let me contrast to you a Palestinian portrait. Onset. It was totally explicable. There was no surprise to the youth of the first intifada why this conflict was happening. Uh, it was yet another in a succession of conflicts that they had heard about regularly from their fathers and grandfathers living in tight camp, tight camp quarters, um, heard about for all of their life. Thus, the intifada that broke out in, 19, in December of 1987 was, was not at all a surprise to them. The tactics of that war were quite different. The fighting was close and proximal. The enemy was always uh, seen and often enticed to come for the conflict. So the fighting was predictable. The nature of the violence, as I said, uh, by our standards was high in terms of loss of life, of course, and destruction of property. But relative to Bosnia, it was low or lower. But there was a different kind of violence. It was a more personal, intrusive kind of violence. Home raids, as you you see that uh, ha happen in Iraq and other places, are a, a common strategy of uh, a, the more powerful entity in a conflict who want to intimidate often uh, or um, very other, various other motives. And, and it will invade your home in, in uh, usually the early hour of the morning, break down the doors, roust out. In this case, uh, they would the soldiers would have ideas that a boy had been throwing stones and they were, went to get him and rousted him out of bed and sometimes beat him off and took him to prison and so forth. 90% of Gazan families experienced uh, house raids and many of them multiple house raids in the course of the conflict. It was very personal, very close, very intrusive, not like the distal form of conflict that the Bosnians had. And the opportunity for resistance was high, very high. Typically or historically, we can say that about 25% of a population of youth uh, in any situation, political situation, would involve themselves in, in the fight or in the conflict or in the social movement. In Gaza, over 90% of youth were involved, and over half of them involved regularly. Uh, astoundingly high numbers of, of participation in political conflict. There's been no other example like it before or since. And that ability to, to engage, to be involved, turns out to be um, a, a important uh, component of the equation that we have to develop. And so there, there are these exceptionally high rates of activism that I mentioned to you. We, we chronicled 17 different types of activism that range from throwing stones to demonstrating to putting tires in the street to block the traffic of a Jeep. They go on and on and on. That's some of the nice detail that one learns on the ground when one spends the time there. So the effects, um, one does find some evidence uh, that uh, of if you just look at the exposure to the violence itself, you find some evidence of the same pattern that you saw in the Bosnian portrait, somewhat lower uh, political and civic involvement and higher antisocial behavior. Culturally speaking, you have to be careful. Antisocial behavior in the Palestinian sense in those years uh, meant smoking tobacco, smoking cigarettes. We kind of, you know, uh, scoff at that here because that's not really a, uh, a big sign of antisocial behavior in our culture, but it is in theirs. Uh, 
And it is the case that uh, the kids who were th throwing stones more often than others ended up smoking cigarettes later to higher degrees. But look at the effects of activism. If you look at the, uh, you know, in all these fancy statistical ways that, that we are able to do with large data sets, you find that the more you are involved as an activist in the conflict in Gaza, five years later, the more likely you were to be involved in political associations. The more likely you were to be involved in, uh, in, in volunteering at school, tutoring friends, volunteering in the community, higher was your level of social competence. Felt better about yourself, forming relationships better, higher empathy. Quite the opposite effects uh, that you find from if you're just looking at the direct exposure to violence. And so for one of the first times, uh, this has been a, a relatively thorough assessment of the degree to which youth become involved in the conflicts that they are, uh, that are surrounding them in their societies. And the evidence is, not just here, in some other cases as well, that there are um, promotive effects of having involved yourself, and we'll explain why, why that might be in a minute. Here's where I want to move then to the final major point, and that is um, this notion that I call identity-relevant meaning systems. Um, This, I'm going to let you read that while I drink. What I mean here is that all of us are familiar, very familiar with the search for meaning, which all of us engage in and which has been very nicely articulated in a number of very important volumes across the decades. I'm not talking about the meaning that we try to make once an event has occurred to us. I'm not talking about the adaptation to a trauma event, which we all do. It's a very understandable process. But I'm talking about meaning that, that occurs on the spot or actually even pre-conflict. How does one make sense of the situation and therefore the conflict itself? What's happening in the mind of the youth at the moment of conflict that prepares him or her to filter it in some way, to make sense out of it? Let me give you some examples of the way this can be parsed out. Historical meaning, the Gazans you would hear talk often about they're suffering from childhood. There's a history to this. This is part of our legacy. This is part of our culture. My father and grandmother lost their country. An extension of my involvement is an extension of my father's spirit. Take me to the Academy of the Palestinians. That was a reference to prison, where in fact, in this case, a young man was taken to, for his third time to prison, and he rejoiced, in fact, because he learned so much about the history of his people there and of conflict and philosophy, and it's amazing what is taught in prisons in these circumstances. We had a look at our history, not just our history, but all of the world's history with revolutions and occupations was a quote from a young man referring to his prison experience. In Sarajevo historical meaning, we couldn't understand what was going on. The true war started, grenades and everything, simply everything turned upside down. I started to see things more serious, and I was praying for survival, basically. No sense, no ability to make sense of this historically, to put this conflict in some kind of historical perspective. It was a surprise, and it was a brutal surprise. And to this day, as many have written about Bosnian youth, there is great bitterness about that. It's impossible for this to happen in the capital of Western Herzegovina. In terms of political meaning, the Bosnians, we didn't know who the enemy was or who we were fighting against. Where are we to go? Where is the enemy? Quite literally, from one day to the next, youth learned that their, many of their classmates were actually Serbs. They didn't know beforehand the difference between a Serb, a Croat, and a, and a Muslim. But all of a sudden, literally from one day to the next, half of their class was gone. Or their Serbian neighbors were fighting or hating them and, and being uh, harsh with them. Serbian marks 
all over the tanks. I write, that's, that's how the youth learned uh, who the enemy was because of the markings on the tanks that indicated something about Serbia. I don't know where they went, referring to the classmates, but I found out that they are fighting because I'm a Muslim. In terms of the political meaning in Gaza, our people had strong determination and courage because we hoped to achieve our rights. <clears throat> when I realized that my father and my grandmother lost their country, we hoped to liberate our country. We believed in many things, in principles, in moral principles. See the difference between the richness uh, of being able to source the political meaning surrounding this conflict, regardless of how you and I might think about the legitimacy of the conflict itself or what side we might be on. That's, that's, that's irrelevant. What's, what matters here is what's happening in the mind of the youth. Can I put this, can I make sense of what's happening here? Does it make, in this case, political sense? We wanted this occupation to end. I can't describe, believe me, I just can't describe what a wonderful feeling it was to share with my people in the struggle against the occupation. In terms of cultural meaning, there are some differences as well. I learned in Gaza, I learned that my people are really great people because during the hard times they could be just like one family. We used to have curfews for maybe 10 or sometimes 15 successive days. And you know what that means, no family, no house has the basic needs, the food actually to live for 15 days. And I remember that when my neighbors were cooking something and we had no food, they were sharing the food with us. Now when I recall these moments, I'm really proud to be a Palestinian. In Sarajevo, listen to the difference. I was a child, 13 years old. I couldn't understand the situation the way it was. It was without any meaning. My parents didn't know and they didn't know what to tell me, why this was happening, what is going to become of us, are we going to be alive? They were frightened. <clears throat> they didn't know how to cope with the situation or how to explain it to us, what to do, whether to leave or stay, where to go, if we were going to be alive or not. They told us they would protect us, but they didn't know what to do. Youth develop different identities in these contexts, very different identities. And I'll just give you a brief glimpse at what I'm thinking might be happening here. I'm calling this a dynamic identity. In Gaza, before the Intifada, we were children. The only thing we thought about was football. Sometimes we studied or watched TV or did many things which were not so important. But during our actions or involvement in the Intifada, we began to think in another way. We began to have a role in our society. We changed the way people thought we became leaders when we were children, so we began to think that we had a great role to perform. By this, we achieved self-satisfaction and self-assertion. That's an identity that is fueled intricately and powerfully and with rich sources of information about who one is, why one is where one is at as a people, where one is going, what rights one has, and so forth, and how I can participate, I as a youth can participate in that. Identity by default is what I'm thinking of regarding the Sarajevans. My Serbian classmates, the kids that I grew up with, were carrying weapons. In one day, they became complete strangers. In some ways, I became a stranger to myself, too. My life and the lives of my family members were in danger because of our names and, our, and religion. I never knew those things mattered, which means that I did not know many things about myself, too. That is what made me a stranger to myself. Notice the emptiness the vacuum, the inability to know what one is except by default, to learn all of a sudden that you are of a religious or ethnic persuasion that's all of a sudden hated by people who you loved previously. A war descends upon you and you have no way to contextualize that war. That makes for a different development of psychological and social identity. Okay, I'm just going to um, take a few minutes now to talk to you about implications and um, in part reiterate then what I started with, that is that we need to do much more careful work to identify which groups of youth are suffering and which are not. To solicit the youth perspectives and the ass to assess the degree of social cultural integration of war youth. I'm going to move quickly over this for a second and get you to this. Um, recently, at the University of Tennessee, we, dis we have formed a, a center. We're calling the Center for the Study of Youth and Political Violence. I was asked to form a center, and this is the idea that I had. I had learned a, a lot, an awful lot um, about, I actually learned a lot about how much we don't know, 
and how much, therefore, we need to know. But beyond that, on the ground in all of those years working these, in these cultures, I learned that there's a huge variety of well-intended professional organizations, professional groups that, that also work on behalf of youth. Um, uh, uh, and that there's very little integration among these groups. I'm talking that there's the researchers like myself who, who care to understand and help, but then there's the educators, there's the policy makers, um, there's the, the NGO quadrant, the non-governmental organizations, the UNs, the WHOs, the Save the Children Foundation, all of these different entities, the clinical professionals who are doing work with the very severely disturbed all of these different quadrants of people trying to help the same population, but there's very little integration among those groups. And so it's the center's goal to, to try to bring some of these groups together and try to see if we can't create a more effective and efficient strategy towards working on behalf of youth. We've got a volume coming out that I, I titled today's presentation after it because it's forthcoming shortly. And that'll set the stage for all we know about from the research community. This is a volume that has chapters from people like myself all around the world who are studying intensively youth from a research perspective. But we also are, are trying to, to convene this integration through what we call a mo conference monograph series. There's much we have to learn from past conflicts is our, uh, our, our assertion. And so we're doing a series of case studies of conflicts around the world in which youth have been involved. And the center is trying to force this, force this integration to happen among well-intended professionals who don't otherwise have the opportunity to meet together. I've just come from Cape Town 10 days ago where we had our first meeting. And there we brought together 10 professionals from Northern Ireland, ironically. Northern Ireland is our case study at the moment. But we wanted to have them in South Africa, not alone to get them away from their hometown, uh, but also to allow the South African counterparts to listen to them talk. And so we brought them to the table literally. We brought the researchers and we brought the practitioners and we brought the programmers and we brought the policy makers to the table and had them talk about how each of their professional realms has dealt with youth in Northern Ireland and the degree to which they have or have not integrated across themselves. And that was a, a very intense uh, experience. Uh, I have not yet had nearly enough time to process it. We learned an awful lot about the conflict in Northern Ireland uh, and we learned an awful lot about how unresolved it is. Uh, I'm going to move you quickly over these. So we are then going to focus on the South African conflict next year. So we're going to bring the South Af 10 representatives from the various professions in South Africa, have them come together, talk about their their efforts towards on, on behalf of youth in South Africa. And we're going to do the same in Israel and Palestine and perhaps in Bosnia as well, and then come up with a, the magic model that, that tries to integrate this and tries to help um, uh, societies deal better with their youth. <clears throat> you may <clears throat> know of Ishmael Bea, a young man who's written a story about his life as a child soldier and his rehabilitation. We have the uh, privilege of bringing him and uh, the leader of the rehab center where he was uh, rehabilitated in Sierra Leone together for the first time and have them talk to us about their individual perspectives and about their very unique and close relationship. We're going to start undergraduate internship programs and visiting scholars programs. We're also going to start convening youth leaders of programs. We're learning that around the world, youth are very active in conflict zones as well as non-conflict zones in, in devising and running and managing programs to help themselves, to help their group. <clears throat> and we're going to bring some of them, th those leaders together so that they can have an opportunity to share their experiences and learn um, about their uh, efforts. I'm going to just close with this anecdote. Uh, two years ago, uh, I guess now, or three, uh, when the center's idea was just forming, coincidentally, we had Africa Week at the University of Tennessee, and we had a delegation from northern Uganda come. I was asked to do a commentary on a film on child soldiers and happened to strike up some conversations with the delegation afterwards. One of them was a member of parliament. 
And the center's idea was freshly brewing in my head, and I, I told her about it. I said, we, you know, we really want to be able to do this kind of integrative approach. And she, um, she looked at me and said, we desperately need you. And I had two thoughts. One is, I'm glad there's a need for what we're trying to do. And the second was, I have no idea what to tell you. And so the center's goal, uh, after these years of efforts, is going to be able to answer that question eventually, I hope, and say, OK, if your culture, your society is facing conflict or anticipating conflict where youth are going to be critically involved, here's, here's the way you can proceed based on past experience of other cultures around the world, based on what we've learned through research. Here's the way you can best prepare for your youth populations. I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have. I'm an anthropologist and I spent about a year doing research with Sudanese refugees, adolescents in a UN camp in northern Kenya, and as you might know, protracted refugee camps are now sort of an emerging trend, sadly, worldwide, sort of on the Palestinian model, but now increasing all over the world. And with that, there's um, commensurate interventions that are now universally applied, whether it's peace education programs or gender equity programs, child rights clubs, um, even K through 12 education. And I'm curious from sort of your survey of different geographical areas, but the same interventions, quality and content from sort of the perspective of psychologists, what works to any significant degree? Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you a very rich answer to that. Um, I, I don't know, um, A, how much those programs have been thoroughly evaluated. I, I, do, I do know and have, I know better the, the um, the peace education programs, at least those that have been held uh, between um, Israelis and Palestinians. And I have some real serious concerns. Um, and so I'll just make one general point, uh, and that is that um, what, what, it, what matters most to the, the future well-functioning of a youth from a conflict zone is what the post-conflict situation is like the degree to which the post-violence situation provides uh, relief from the violence, relief from the trauma, a reconnection with society, an opportunity to move on via education, via family formation, and so forth. It is unfortunately the case that in many conflicts around the world, the conflict has not ended post-violence. And there's a real concern about peace education programs, which, with all good intentions in mind, bring young people together, extract them from their region, bring them together, teach them about tolerance and diversity and forgiveness and so forth, and find that that's an uplifting experience for both sides. But the ugly reality in many cases is that those youth are then placed back into a situation where those high ideals of forgiveness and and, and, and tolerance of diversity are virtually impossible to live out given the, the inequities that continue to exist on the ground. And so my concern about the peace education programs is that they, set, they can set youth up for expectations which they themselves cannot fulfill and, and may in the end uh, do a disservice rather than a, a service. And, and I, I'm not familiar enough with the research on the other initiatives to, to give you in detail. Um, hi. In the, um, for this lecture, we have done some background reading right. on some of your research. And one of the things that, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had mentioned that uh, it's a different experience for females in the Muslim culture of Palestine. And I was wondering how you felt about the application of um, this meaning structure to females in, let's say, your research in Northern Ireland in areas that aren't so segregated by gender? That's a great question. Thank you for it. 
Um, at the broadest level, I would say that in terms of effects of exposure to political conflict or involvement in conflict and its effect on youth development, there are not major differences between male and female experience. That's certainly the case for activism. The, the effects of activism are equally as strong for females and equally as broad for females as they are for males. The complication comes, as you rightly note, is, uh, and it, I'm going to link that to my answer to the previous question, is, is the existing, in this case, cultural expectations that survive the conflict. Um, and in the, and I would say that, that this would probably be more critical in the Palestinian territories than it would be in Northern Ireland, for example. As you correctly point out, the gender, gender differences are not so stark. In the Palestinian case, females were, um, were very welcome to participate in the conflict. Um, it was a social movement. Old and young, male and female, didn't matter. Everyone was out throwing stones or doing whatever was called on. And females felt good about that, and males felt fine about them doing that. Post-conflict, then the traditional culture reasserts itself. And so the issue for females, more critically for males then, would be the degree to which that liberating experience of having contributed to the cause uh, can be maintained in the tradi traditional culture. And there's no easy answer to that question uh, because there are uh, countervailing forces as well. Many, many females in, in cultures like that feel very comfortable with the traditional private sphere role and don't have a difficulty transitioning back to the private sphere um, given uh, all the benefits they perceive that to have for them culturally and religiously. But for, for those women, and there are, uh, there is a subset of uh, um, Muslim women who have felt the desire to continue that sense of liberation and emancipation that was provided by virtue of their contribution. And to the extent the society does or does not permit, it, permit that, it's going to have an impact on how they function long term. Was that, was that helpful? There is going to be a reception afterwards, so if people want to stay and talk to Brian, we'll have some time outside, and you're welcome. To, anybody's welcome to come to that. So, and one, one more question. Up here. All the conflicts that you uh, looked at are they all related to uh, religious differences? And if, if not so, is there a difference between the way that people adjust conflict if it's if um, cultural and, and religious ties are present, or are, as present? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, uh, certainly not all conflicts are fueled ostensibly as religious conflicts. The South African conflict, for example, was much more about human rights than it was about um, a religion. But even those where religion is used as the label for the conflict, one often finds that it's really not religion, per se. In Northern Ireland, I've learned a whole lot now. <laughs> and, um, and, and all of us can disagree on this, and, and the Northern Irish disagree on this. But it appeared to me as if that was a, as much an argument about social opportunity and inequity as it was about religious differences. It happens to be that societies have parceled themselves out in different ways and certain religious groups have different levels of advantage. And it seems to be a, a conflict of, of uh, economic opportunity as much as it is about religious differences. It's very hard to sort those kind of things out. Um, so uh, I, would, I, would always, I would always want to know the degree to which religious differences were paired with other social and economic and political uh, inequities before we could start teasing out the degree to which religion played a significant role. Because in the end, people want to live. Parents want to raise their kids, feed their kids, and send them to school. And if that happens economically and politically, 
um, that typically trumps religious difference. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for coming. Okay.